Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel. I think I've got well over 600 now. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel or backing me on Patreon and subscribing to me here as I upload at least twice a week. Before I start today's video, a shout out to artist Jason Engel, a superb fantasy illustrator, some of my favourite Magic the Gathering card art and so many images you will recognise over the years for our hobby are thanks to Jason. But I have to add a note to this video that I will not be using Jason's original art from Dragon Magazine issue 359 published in September 2007 to represent the subject of today's video because, oof. Man, I feel for him in this one. That brief he must have gotten for that pair of illustrations must have been bad. <laughs> to be fair, he did the best he could, but wow. I'll include them here for accuracy so you can see what I mean. The Time Dragon, and for the details of this super powerful dragon of beyond colossal size, they decided to literally take elements from clocks and style the dragon after them. Clocks. Like two spikes on the tail, one long and one short to represent the hands of a clock. That's just stupid. So no, I'll be using other artwork during the video. Thank you very much. No offence intended to Jason. I love your work. Today I present to you the lore of the Time Dragon, created by Mike MacArthur. I'll also compare this a little bit at the end of the video to the Time Dragon from Pathfinder 1st Edition Bestiary Number 4, one of the neutral outer space dragons, which along with the other outer category space dragons just have the ability to live and fly around in space and they have various aspects but the time dragon from 3.5 edition is the real meat and potatoes of this video plus the first appearance of what would later become the roll 2d20 advantage mechanic for dnd so it's extremely important to be very clear that the time dragons are epic category dragons they are way beyond the capability of most player characters to take on in combat and it is extremely unlikely that this would ever happen in the game thanks to these dragons just not being interested in such a thing also because people are bound to ask yes these dragons can easily kill a terrasque they can take on demon lords and win they are when they reach great worm age category the equivalent of at least demigods they are very very powerful, most likely the most powerful type of dragons in the multiverse, short of the dragon pantheon. Time dragons, like the other epic dragons, are size category huge, even when they are freshly hatched wormlings. They also have a lot of the special qualities and abilities that lesser dragons have to live for centuries to acquire, such as an innate spell knowledge, a resistance to magical attacks and frightful presence. As they age, their sorcery allows them to easily enhance their spells with metamagic empowerment, and their supernatural powers to consume, manipulate, and travel through time are far beyond anything most other dragons can do. Like all true dragons, time dragons, also known as chronology dragons, epoch dragons, or ageless dragons, have 12 distinct age categories, and they only get more powerful with age rather than reaching middle years and deteriorating like we do. They don't conform to the alignment division of metallic and chromatic dragons, they are generally neutral, and they have a full range of personality types, but as a rule, they have no society, they live apart from one another and mortal creatures, preferring to spend what little social time they have with powerful immortals and gods. When they do gather, it is expressly for the purpose of mating, and they do so in groups of 4 to 10 once every 1,000 years, staying together in one location until all the females have been fertilized and they then disband, likely never seeing one another again. Where the females lay their eggs, exact method they use to incubate them, or how long the gestation and incubation times are, is unknown. When the wormlings hatch, they appear silvery white and then darken and gain more individual appearance as they age, but the scales remain quite smooth in appearance throughout their life, and they are unlike other dragons in that there is quite a bit of variation in the placement and growth of horns from their head and body. I suppose the most distinctive and recognisable trait is their sheer size and power. Everything else about them is quite individual to them, so basically. If you find some really awesome huge dragon picture, just go with what you prefer, or use the images for the Pathfinder Time Dragon or the ones that I provide here. It's fine. One of the most mobile of the dragon species, time dragons rarely put much effort into gathering or even protecting their hordes. They have very little interest in coins or even gems, but they do collect lore, artifacts, magic items, and artistic objects of great value. They will do so over and over again throughout their very long lives. 
they are always on the lookout for truly amazing and highly accurate timekeeping devices, collecting them like a mad scientist time machine inventor in some cases, but just out of curiosity in other cases. When they reach a level of maturity where they can finally travel through time, they will typically establish a lair in the prehistory or far future of a world where there are no humanoids around to pilfer their lair or pester them with their fleeting dramas and ambitions. From their perspective, anything less than the most powerful Archmages are little more than sprites by comparison to their size and power. The mightiest empires of humanity are nothing more than interesting bookmarks in the role of eons as they traverse at their leisure. Time dragons younger than great worms can go many months without eating anything, but doing so makes them lethargic and grumpy. So they'll browse on trees and rich soil um, along fertile rivers, not bothering to hunt down creatures to eat, as most creatures are just too small to be much of a meal anyway. Only serious disasters and other creatures can kill a time dragon. The passage of time obviously can't. So they are the only dragons beside the dragon pantheon that are immortal. At the time the Dragon Magazine article was published in 2007, the convention was that size categories maxed out at one step beyond Colossal, they call this simply Colossal Plus, and no additional stats were assigned to larger creatures or objects. However, back in the D&D Basic Immortal set and in Spelljammer, there are categories beyond Colossal, and I made an extended chart which will be handy when dealing with how big these dragons get, and dealing with super huge spaceships and things like that. So a combat encounter with a Wormling Time Dragon for 5th edition just use the stat block of an adult red dragon, except it will have different special abilities. The breath of a Time Dragon comes in two types, either a line of ravaged time or a cone of time expulsion. The cone of time expulsion is really easy to manage. The targets within the area of effect must make a constitution saving throw. In both cases, the minimum DC would be 24 for the Wormling breath weapon. If they make the save, they're fine. If they fail, they appear to just vanish. Onlookers who have never seen this before will think that the breath weapon of incomprehensible misty bright radiance just vaporized any who failed the saving throw with no trace of them remaining. However, what it actually does is throw the targets forward in time. For each age category of the dragon, the targets are thrown forward one round. So if an adult time dragon unleashes a 70 foot cone of temporal energy, the victims will suddenly find themselves six combat rounds in the future, which is enough to make the time dragon highly formidable in and of itself. You can allow the player characters caught up by this to make a wisdom saving throw at the end of each round to see if they can pop back into the current time, if you feel merciful. And that's just the first ability it has. The Wormling Cone reaches only 50 feet, but a Great Worm can blast it out over 80 feet. The line of ravaging time will age anything caught in the 5 foot high and 5 foot wide line, which reaches 100 feet for the Wormling and over 160 feet for the Great Worm. Again, minimum constitution saving throw is DC 24 for the Wormling. Those who fail it are aged, as though they had just lost several years of life per age category of the Time Dragon. I think the best way to represent this in 5th edition is to impose one level of exhaustion and reduce the victim's maximum hit points by the roll of one of their hit dice per age category of the dragon. That's the player character's hit dice, so if they're whatever hit dice they use for their character class. While objects simply lose one point of armor class and 10% of their hit points per age category of the dragon, obviously this can kill things and make them crumble into dust. The age effect can be reversed with a greater restoration spell, but only within 24 hours of it occurring. For objects, it can be reversed with a simple mending spell in most cases. A time dragon emerges from its egg with an innate level of control over the flow of time and the rate it moves through it, so that even a hatchling can accelerate its actions relative to the actions of others. As a free action, the dragon can act as though under the influence of a haste spell for up to five rounds per day, and those rounds can be spaced out however the dragon desires. The haste spell provides plus two armor class and advantage on dexterity saving throws, and it gains an additional action on each of its turns. That action can only be used to take the attack, one weapon attack only, dash, disengage, hide, or use an object action. Plus, all time dragons are completely immune to any slow effects, so it suffers no penalty when it stops being hasted. Even as a wormling, the dragons have the power to use time stop, as per the ninth level spell, at will. However, they do need to wait 2d4 rounds before they can use it again. With Time Stop, 
The dragon can briefly stop the flow of time for everyone but itself. No time passes for other creatures, while the dragon takes 1d4 plus 1 turns in a row, during which it can use actions and move as normal. This spell ends if one of the actions of the dragon uses during this period, or any effects that it creates during this period, affects a creature other than the dragon, or an object being worn or carried by someone other than the dragon. In addition, the spell ends if the dragon moves to a space more than 1,000 feet away from where it's created this effect. As mentioned, they have the spellcasting ability from hatching, with a caster level the same as a 4th level draconic sorcerer as wormlings, advancing by 3 caster levels per age category they obtain. By the very first advancement from wormling to very young category, they obtain the draconic surge ability, which allows them to, once per day, as a bonus action, Borrow some time from the future and make an additional standard action or move action during their turn. An old or older category time dragon can do this twice per 24 hours. In addition to their own hastening, they can now cast slow at will as a spell-like effect, which they can use to with pinpoint control along with the full range of physical attacks and their other normal spellcraft from the levels of sorcery. Even freshly hatched, a time dragon has all the attack forms of a fully developed red dragon, including tail swipes, wing beats, bite and claw attacks, and with its ever increasing size, an attack form you don't see very much these days, but is very handy for dealing with creatures this big. A crush is a special attack that allows a flying or jumping dragon of at least huge size to land on opponents as a standard action, using its whole body to crush them. Crush attacks are effective against opponents three or more size categories smaller than the dragon, but a crush attack affects as many creatures as can fit under the dragon's body. Creatures in the affected area must also succeed on a dexterity saving throw equal to the dragon's breath weapon difficulty class, so minimum of DC 24 for the time dragon, or they are restrained and automatically take the same damage as a bite attack from the dragon as long as they are pinned down each round. The dragon can either get up and let them go the next round or maintain its position, in which case it is resolved the same way as a normal grapple attack, and yes, you apply the dragon's strength bonus to the damage it does with this attack. By its adult stage, the time dragon is now colossal in size and its powers are expanding. From this point on, the time dragon operates continuously under a haste spell-like effect without the ability to willfully suppress it, even if dispelled the effect will immediately resume at the start of the dragon's next turn without any action or thought required on its part. Before reaching adult stage, the dragon had to wait at least 2d4 rounds between uses of its time stop. Now they can do it every 1d4 rounds. By the ancient growth stage, the dragon can now emanate a slowing aura. This is indicative of not just its godlike control of time around it, but also a small amount of control of space in close proximity. For each age category of the dragon, this aura extends 10 feet, so at least 100 feet for the ancient dragon, up to a maximum of 120 feet aura for the Great Worm. With the expenditure of a free action, the dragon activates the aura for that round. It can do this up to 10 rounds per day in total. It doesn't have to use all of these rounds at once. This is far more potent than a spell-like effect, as any creature that starts its turn in the aura or enters it while it is active automatically gets slowed as per the spell with no saving throw. Finally, when the time dragon reaches Great Worm stage, it reaches a level of mastery called Time Apotheosis, able to travel forward and backward in time almost at will. This movement through time allows the Great Worm dragon to wait only one round between uses of its time stop spell-like ability. In addition, a Great Worm time dragon becomes immune to any spell effect with a duration greater than instantaneous cast on it by another creature, as well as effects that can affect it over time or that require the passage of time, such as dehydration, disease, poison and starvation. It's not immune to its own spell effects, of course. Because a Great Worm time dragon can make forays into the past and possible futures, it rolls 2d20 for every single d20 roll it makes and takes the better of the two results. This is actually the first instance I've seen of the advantage mechanic that would later be become such a core aspect of 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, though I don't know if it was in any way responsible for it. Eh, who can say? Actual time travel is something that requires preparation and is not something that a dragon ever does in combat situations. The process is way beyond most mortal humanoids. However, the Time Dragon article 
uh, directs readers to check out the Chronomancy sidebar on page 77 of Dragon Magazine 350, published December 2006. So let's take a look at that bit, shall we? And I quote, Aside from the offered suggestions, no hard rules exist in Dungeons and Dragons for time travel. This is largely because the characters wandering the breadth of fantasy eras can quickly send a game in limitless and largely unpredictable directions. Even with the limits this article applies to chronomancers, because this article is from an article about chronomancers, no spell allows you to merely skip back and do over your last turn or actually travel through the ages. An actual jaunt through time could completely derail an unprepared DM's campaigns. Thus, DMs are advised not to make this, this decision to add time travel to the games without carefully considering the effects. Player characters with the power to skip through the ages can weaken a dungeon master's control over the game, ultimately making it less fun to play. Uh, I'd say that is true of published and structured adventures and organized play, for sure. But freeform style sandbox games with uh, dungeon masters who are perfectly capable to wing it with random generation tables and just riffing along with the player character's antics is absolutely nothing wrong with time travel. Embrace the chaos, I say. Okay, back to the text. This warning aside, some of the most popular stories in D&D have involved past ages and time travel. Dragonlance's War of the Twins novels saw characters traveling back and forth through the ages. The Forgotten Realm's Arcane Age subsetting allows players to explore a time of incredible powerful magical empires, long ruined in the modern campaign setting. Even the classic Expedition to the Barrier Peaks adventure, while lacking actual time travel, has memorable elements of future technologies. We have laser guns in the Dungeons Master's Guide for a reason, my friends. Future tech is, not, um, is indistinguishable from spell-like effects, it's very easy to include in the game. Time travel raises questions on how visitors to past eras might affect those who come after. While movies like Back to the Future show characters leaping back and forth through the time to correct the results of their actions, Ray Bradbury's short story The Sound of, uh, Sound of Thunder shows that even the most subtle interference with the past can have unimaginably far-reaching effects. On the other hand, Dragonlance posits that most changes to the past have minimal effects on the current timeline, and the flow of years is largely stable. The novel Stamping Butterflies by uh, Jim Grimwood even proposes that events in the future can alter the past. Mm. Well, my advice is always to keep it simple and make time very robust in your games. The players should know damn well when they have seriously messed up the future with their actions, but I'd have them insulated from these changes, because when they travel to the past, they become a part of it. Thus, the past becomes their new present. Even if they blew up the city that their great-grandparents are living in and technically erased their own origin, they don't suddenly vanish, because the past is now their present. However, if they travel forward to where they started off, the world no, will, will no longer know that they existed. Thus, the paradox is avoided while also basically included in the game story. You can come up with your own system for doing this. If you're dealing with time dragons, then there are probably other temporal agents, entities and gods zipping around with their own agenda that the players can get involved with. The last part of the article says, Currently no spell, artifact or creature in D&D can time travel over a span of years. <laughs> well, that didn't last long. <laughs> Some creatures come close to actual time travel, such as the Fane from the Epic Level Handbook. You should check out my video on them. Even those with high level creatures are shackled through the laws of the ages. If you wish to add time travel to your game, there are several ways that it can be accomplished. Regarding magic, a spell allowing time travel should be nothing less than an Epic Level Incantation, or the purview of an item of artifact level power. It might also function in a similar way to Planner Portals, being merely a gate to another age, past or future, and probably including the same perils of planar travel. Alternatively, time travel might be the purview of deities of travel and time, such as Lendor in Greyhawk, and perhaps Finder Wivenspur or Yurgle in the Forgotten Realms and Orion in Eberron. Overall, the ability to travel through time should remain in the hands of the Dungeon Master and be customised to suit the needs of the campaign. Okay, let's take a look at the Outer Dragon of Time in Pathfinder 1st Edition, Bestiary 4. Guardians of History. Time Dragons are the most powerful of the Outer Dragons, Watchers and Waiters. Time Dragons guard the universe against those who would interfere with the natural temporal order. The Ancient Time Dragon is Challenge Rating 20, Gargantuan, Neutral Alignment, Armor Class 37, 418 Hit Points, Damage Reduction 15, 
breathes a cone of electricity out to 60 feet and has some divination like spell ability abilities and sorcerer spells and the following abilities uh, they age but they don't die from age, old age they get a bonus to their initiative based on their age category they have an alien presence rather than just a frightful presence uh, three times per day they can force any creature to re-roll a d20 roll including themselves three times in the dragon's life they can travel uh, through time and take along someone for the ride they have the trait called shifting breath where an old or older dragon can displace creatures in time exactly like the time dragon from dragon magazine so really not a huge difference except the dragons uh, from the dungeons and dragons original version were far more powerful don't forget epic dragons always have legendary resistance legendary actions and lair actions as well as some truly incredible regional effects such as everyone who lives near the dragon never actually dying of old age as long as the dragon's around if you have any suggestions for cool lair and regional effects by all means let me know down in the comment section you know i love hearing from you and you can come up uh, and chat with us on the discord server about it on um, there's a link in the video description on this channel for those who wonder how formidable a great worm time dragon actually is in a purely physical sense their size category is gigantic they are over 500 feet long and weigh over 1200 tons they're not particularly agile at normal t uh, temporal speeds they have a penalty of minus 24 to hit with melee attacks on something as tiny as a humanoid but their grapple checks are plus 24 and they can pick up and throw a tarasque like you or i would throw an armadillo they have a wingspan of well over a thousand feet they can fly at 120 miles per hour or comfortably cover 480 miles of travel in one day of relaxed flight they have an armor class of 22 even with a penalty of minus 24 due to their sheer size and their hit point average is 3712 getting anywhere near them with all that haste slowing magic artifacts and their time stop ability plus having advantage on every roll that they make <laughs> good luck with that please hit the like button if you made it this far subscribe if you like what i do check out my patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos buy some merchandise wear your geek with pride and as always thanks for listening and i'll be back with more for you very soon